Hey y'all, Coachina Fight here, talking about the Spring Feast. We want to do a summary of the Spring Holy Days, talking about Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits. We've put out several classes on those. So if you want to get really detailed classes on you know some of these subjects, feel free to jump over there and look at those videos. And this one, we just want to wrap everything up in one place. And I do want to give a lot of detail, but I don't want to take a lot of time. So what I'm going to do is give you the verses that I'm referencing down there on your screen and you can hit the pause button and read those um, as I skim through them and just give you the highlights of what Passover is what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is and we're going to talk about first fruits through this as well now some of the questions we're going to ask in this is the what who where how and when of Passover so this should be a pretty good summary but again if you want more detail jump over there and look at the playlist that we have on Passover that because we've gone through almost all of these um, subjects in greater detail some of those classes took a good chunk of time as we study scripture after scripture in order to get the information we needed and so in this one we're just going to wrap everything up roll everything up you know hopefully keeping this video pretty short now, the first thing we want to talk about is what are holy feast days? What are these holy feast days? Now, some of some people haven't heard of these holy feast days, Passover, Eleven Bread, First Fruits. They've heard of things like Christmas, Easter, and Halloween and those. But you can think of those as being the feast of man, whereas these feasts over here are the feast of the Lord. Like you see over there in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 2, the holy, the holy days are the feast of the Lord don't be confused you know sometimes the scriptures say the feast of the Jews but you know what it's talking about is Israel spiritual Israel and how they are the only ones keeping those days and by doing so it doesn't matter who you are by doing those off uh, uh, days makes you kind of makes you spiritual Israel but those are the feast days of the Lord now Another thing we have to understand about the feast days are is, is that they are a sign of the Father. You see over here in Exodus chapter 13 and 9, these are that sign that we hear about put on our hand and our forehead or, or, or between our eyes. If you think of this as the mark of the Father, keeping these feast days is the mark of the Father. And, you know... One would argue that not keeping them would be the mark of the beast, but you know you can check that out in some other classes over there. Now, we now we do these feast days in remembrance of the Messiah. You remember over there in uh, Luke chapter twenty-two and verse nineteen when it was talking about the Last Supper and how when the Messiah gave them the cup to drink with the wine in it, he told them to do this in remembrance of him. And so this is why we one of the reasons why we do this every year was that, you know, this was kind of like a direct order from the Messiah telling us to do it in remembrance of him. Now, we do understand that that bread and that wine was symbolic uh, in nature. Um, there's nothing, you know, special about the material bread or the material wine. But by taking part in those sacraments, we understand that we are taking part in the supper with the Messiah. For instance, you know, that, that last supper table was a representation or a symbol of the kingdom of heaven. And so by partaking in that, it's kind of like we're, we're going, you know, having that marriage supper kind of deal. But we are remembering it that, you know, it is that nourishment of the essence of the word that we are seeking after and what we are receiving by way of keeping the feast of Passover, unleavened bread, and even first fruits. Now, the next thing up is who must do these feasts? Who must keep these feasts? Is everybody on the planet required? Well, at one point, it will be so. Everybody on the planet will keep the feast. But now, the main people who are required to keep these feasts are anybody who wants to consider themselves spiritual Israel um, if you you can read there in the third testament of the Bible chapter 39 and verse 19 who spiritual Israel is like I said hit the pause button and you can read down through here it gives some detail so you can know whether you are spiritual Israel or not basically if you're faithful to the law faithful to the truth if you you know um, helping others just read it in, the, in there 
But these are the people nowadays in 2020 who are required to keep these feasts while the rest of the world seem to be doing their own thing. Um, these, it is these, these people, some call them the first fruits that are actually keeping these feasts. Now, some of those are the 144,000. Those guys will absolutely be keeping the holy feast days. Um, if they, if they're, if they may be candidates for the 144,000, they may feel that calling on their life. But if they aren't keeping these feast days, you know, it's questionable whether they're actually going to make the cut, whether they're going to make their calling and election sure. Remember, there's a preparation that they have to do, and these feast days are part of that preparation. And the 144,000 are the forerunners. They're the guys that's going to help lead the rest of us down the right path. And so they'll be of the first that will be keeping uh, these holy feast days. But one thing different about this era, you see me keep mentioning uh, the third testament of the Bible. You can find a link to it down in the description if you want to, both an audio and a PDF version that you can download to your computer. Um, about the third testament of the Bible, the third part of the trilogy with the Old Testament being the first, the New Testament being the second. The third testament of the Bible is where we get a lot of spirit, a lot of truth and, uh, and understanding about the spirit and that kind of thing. Well, we're finding that the humanity has changed in the third era and one of the things that changes is that women are uh, partaking in these feast days they were the men were the only ones required to do so back there in the Old Testament with Moses it was only men over the age of 20 that was required to make that uh, that trek down to Jerusalem but here in the third era women are also seated at the table they become our equal in this era all right, now the next section that we want to talk about is why do we keep these feast days? Why do we do them at all? Why is it important? And the first thing up on the list is how they protect us from these pestilences. Now, a lot of people are interested in this because, you know, all these coronaviruses and COVID-19 and HIV and all of these other plagues and, and stuff is taking over the world. Um, it is through Passover and some other feasts that we actually get protections from it. You can see it. In, in Julius chapter 49 and 15 that Passover gives us a protection from the um, the plagues but if you look over there at Zechariah chapter 14 and 18 you see also uh, the Feast of Tabernacles which is a fall feast also gives us uh, protections from the plagues and the pestilences so if you want to stay healthy you you want to keep these feasts so that's another reason why another reason why is it's the beginning of joy Tabernacles, as I mentioned, is um, one of the feasts of the Lord, but it is a solemn occasion. That one's in the fall, but in the spring, the Passover is the beginning of joy. You see over here in Jubilees chapter 49 and verse 2, it is a joyous occasion. Um, and sometimes it uses uh, Passover and unleavened bread interchangeably. It's unleavened bread that's actually a week long joyous feast. You actually celebrate every you know, all week long um, in, a, in a state of joy. Um, now, another reason why we keep the annual feast, uh, particularly Passover, is because it's a purification of our temples. Um, if you remember every year they went in and when they had a brick and mortar temple they went in and they purified that temple by way of blood every year they went in and, and took blood and put it here and sprinkled it there well we don't use blood anymore thank the messiah we 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 don't use the blood of animals to do that anymore but still we're getting that re that remission of sins that purification of our temples it is by way of passover that we get that purification and we get that every year now another reason why we do this is so important is because that temple is prophesied to be, be built, to be built on the hearts and uh, minds of humanity. Um, if you look over there in the book of Daniel chapter 12 uh, verse 11 and 12 and look at what Daniel was talking about in his prophecy if you add up knowing that the the, the times that we were talking about when the daily sacrifice was taken away and you start to add up the years um, 1290 plus the 1335 and don't forget about the one year because there was no year zero and so this is another reason why it's so important to keep 
these of uh, the feast of Passover is because you know we could actually be ready for this third temple uh, this temple that's going to be built in you know the hearts of humanity we don't want to miss out on that and then over here um, in Exodus chapter 12 and 15 you can see that if we don't keep the feast days we'll be cut off now it's talking about being cut off from Israel or spiritual Israel like we talked about a few minutes ago uh, how we are a spiritual Israel which doesn't have anything to do with blood ties or anything like that but it's, it's on a spiritual nature. And so if we don't keep these, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that spirituality can be cut off. We can become separated from spiritual Israel. Maybe even end up back there in, uh, in Egypt. If you look at the Leviticus curses, we can end up you know, going backwards. So we have to keep the Feast of Passover to make sure we don't do that. Now, another reason we want to keep the uh, Feast Days is because of that seal that you see over there in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4 well if you look in second if you look in second Esdras chapter 2 and verse 37 you see that we are sealed at the Lord's feast verse 38 is one actually says it that we are sealed at the Lord's feast and so that's another reason why we keep the feast days is that we want to get that seal that's talked about over there in revelations all right now the next section we're going to talk about is where do we keep the feast there's a lot of you know discussion about how you know we don't have a brick and mortar temple anymore it was destroyed by the Romans back there in 70 AD and so there's a lot of people that don't keep the feast days because they don't have that temple well the thing about it you know we were keeping those feast days before we had a temple if you read over there in Exodus chapter 12 and you know so they were keeping the feast days before they had the temple and we never was really told to actually um, um keep those exclusively in a temple nowhere in the scripture I think man kind of assumed that once he had a brick and mortar temple that that's where they were supposed to take place but we see over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 that the temples are with man like we said, that, that third temple built on the hearts of humanity, we are the temple. So when we are looking for the place in order to have our feast days, our holy convocations, is basically wherever we're at. We are the temple, and so wherever our temple is at is the new Jerusalem, and that's where we are to keep our feast days. We look over here in Exodus chapter 12 and 3, like we said a, few, uh, a little while ago, like we said on the last slide, um, they were keeping these feast days before there was a temple. Well, in Exodus chapter 12, there wasn't even a tabernacle in place. That tent that they were walking around in the wilderness, that wasn't even built yet. And they were keeping the feast of Passover. And that's what you see right there in 12 and 3, how he's telling them uh, to get the lamb and be prepared to, um, to prepare that lamb for eating on the feast of unleavened bread. And you see how it says a lamb for a house. This is a this is a ceremony um, that will take place in one's own home, not down there at the church. You know, everybody eating you know that one lamb. This is you know a feast for for your family. And if your family wasn't big enough, then you might bring over a neighbor or so. But it was done at your own home. Now the next section we want to talk about is how do we keep the holy days. Now, one of the main things about the Feast of Passover is bread and wine. This is what we do on Passover. Passover is a preparation day. Um, you look over there in the Third Testament of the Bible, chapter 4 and 6. You, you, you understand the spiritual, you start to get an uh, idea of the spiritual nature behind the bread and the wine. Uh, it says, the Messiah was telling him that he is the way, the truth, and the life which those sacraments represent. But that is what we do on Passover. Passover is the bread and the wine. It is also the day that they will prepare the lamb. They will cook the lamb for those that will be having lamb this year. They will they'll actually be uh, preparing that lamb and cooking that lamb on the day of Passover. Unleavened bread is a, um, is a Sabbath day. And the first day of unleavened bread is a fab Sabbath day, at least. And they can't really do any cooking on that day. They can't really do any preparation on that day. All of that's done on the day of Passover. 
And also on Passover is the day they take the leaven out of their house. You look over there in Exodus chapter 13 and 7 is the day that they remove the leaven out of their house. So a lot of people will be, you know, basically cleaning the house, getting all of the leavening out. But, you know, you also have to jump over to uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 11 and 12 to find out what that le- to find out that leaven also includes church doctrine. Verse 12, he was talking about uh, how leaven is the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the church leaders of way back there and then. And, and so we don't really consider them Pharisees and Sadducees today. They go by other names today like reverends and clergy and stuff. But it's the same people. And it is that doctrine that we are to avoid during um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We are to avoid that leavening for the whole week. Well, it's the day of Passover that we remove that stuff out. So a lot of people will be taking out um, books like, you know, um, Billy Graham books or or um, Kenneth Copeland books. And they'll be taking that kind of stuff out of the house. And they won't be going down there to the church either during that week. Now, there are some who will be doing foot washings during the day of Passover. The Messiah did a foot washing back there on during the Last Supper. And, you know, I don't know if we have all of the information associated with that Passover. Like we read over here in chapter 13 of the book of John, how the Messiah was telling him that you don't know exactly what I'm doing now. In verse 7, he says, you don't know what I'm doing just yet, but you'll find out one day. Um, There's some people who go ahead and do this uh, foot washing on Passover. I'm sure it has something to do with uh, humility and brotherly love. But I believe it also has something to do with the fact that in order to go into the temple, they was always required to wash their hands and their feet. They had to wash their feet and their hands before they went into the into the um, into the uh, temple. And so I've, I've always believed that that's why the Messiah did it is because, you know, those guys were about to do something spiritually. And the Messiah was making sure they had uh, met those requirements that we read over there in Leviticus about how they are to wash wash their feet but another thing we are required to do is to talk about the exodus with our children we read over there in the exodus chapter 13 and verse 8 how we are to talk about how the children of israel was led out of egypt um, back there in 1400 bc or whatever but I want to bring something out over there in Jeremiah 23 and 7, how he's talking about the modern day Exodus. You can, like I said, pause and take a look at these. But what he's saying is how, you know, people are not going to consider the, um, they're not going to talk about the father, about how he brought us out of that Egypt long time ago. He's going to talk about how he brought us out of modern day Egypt. And that's what you see a lot of people going through is they're leaving the cities and going off into the countries and spending a lot of time in the word and renewing themselves in these feasts and other different you know, covenants and different stuff. This is a modern day exodus that's going on now. And so at some point, we'll start to, you know, remind our children about how this happened to us, you know, between 2014, 2021, we'll remind them of those days. Now, on the Feast of First Fruits, this is the third uh, feast day of the year, the third Holy Convocation. On this one, you'll take bundles of ripening produce and wave them around. We go around and find just about everything that's all edible plants that are growing and even though they're not ripe yet you know we have tomatoes growing we have uh, pecans growing different stuff growing around we'll take you know small parts of those and put them in little bundles and then each one of us will walk around with that and we'll wave them and we'll sing songs it's a wave offering but now unleavened bread is a week long feast that that one lasts from the 15th day all the way up to the 21st day of the first month that's a week long feast where we basically read the scripture like we talked about a few minutes ago uh, taking 11 and this out is getting rid of all of that church doctrine well what you learn what you're left with is the word of God itself 
And so for that week, we read that word, or we get that, that nourishment from the Bible, from the essence of the word. As we read it for that whole week, it's kind of like a download period. Um, you get you get a lot more insight during that period. Let me speak for myself. And what I believe is true is that you get a lot. You, you, it's, a, it's a period that you know you, you're able to get a lot of understanding from the scripture, whereas you might not get it for the rest of the year. And that's because it's during that special time. Time, that that week long unleavened bread period but you can read about the essence of the word over there in the third testament of the bible chapter 14 and 29 um and again there's a link down there in the description now also talking about unleavened bread the first day of unleavened bread is a sabbath day and the last day of unleavened bread is a sabbath day um this is the one of the ways we know when that sabbath day is actually supposed to fall throughout the year there's people arguing whether it's saturday or sunday or whatever but you know looking at you know how they fell in the old testament kind of gives you an idea when they're supposed to be and so when you're looking at leviticus chapter 23 verse 7 and 8 you see that the first day of unleavened bread is a Sabbath day and the last day now the thing about it Passover is not a Sabbath day uh, Passover is a day that you're going to be doing a lot of work you're going to be doing a lot of preparation a lot of cooking a lot of you know getting prepared uh, for the first day of unleavened bread because you basically have to have everything done before that time now Next, we're going to talk about when are the feast days. Now, in order to understand when the feast days are, you have to understand that seasons, years, and months are all determined by the sun and the moon and their positions in the sky. We can see that over there in Genesis chapter 1. Um, where he told us how his calendar was supposed to work. Um, of course, now mankind has their own calendars. They have the Gregorian calendars, and just about every other nation has a, a different kind of calendar that they use. But, you know, the Father's calendar was given to us way back over there in Genesis chapter 1, and it hasn't changed, and it's never going to change. But if you want to know how that calendar works, you have to go to the book of Enoch. And uh, chapter 72 and 73 tells us how those um, how the calendar is supposed to work. Chapter 72 talks about the uh, when the year starts. The year starts with the spring equinox, and uh, chapter 73 tells us when the months start. And the month starts with the new moon. If you want to get you know some practical scripture on the month starting. Go over there to 1 Samuel chapter 20 and when David is partaking in the uh, new moon celebration over there and it shows you how the days fall according to the moon. But we'll save that for another class. All right. So now the holy, the spring feast, you look over in Leviticus chapter 23 uh, verse 5 and 10. You see when the spring feasts fall, remember there are three of them. Passover, unleavened bread, and the feast of first fruits. But now I did want to note, I did want to make a special note about the spring feast. Is they're the only ones with a second chance? You read over there in Numbers chapter 9 and verse 9 through 11. Where you can see that there are special circumstances that if you're not able to participate in the feast of Passover uh, in the first month, that you can actually take part in it in the second month. Now, this is important um, to note because there are a lot of people that will have to take advantage of this especially people going through this pandemic or for you know a lot of people dying or whatever but I wouldn't just take advantage of it just because it's there I don't think that's what it was meant for you know if you got something going on and, and then you say well you know I wanted to go you know to Easter and you know keep Easter in the first month and then so I'm gonna do Passover in the next month I don't know if it works like that but it is available and I think it was important to to bring that out in case you are watching this after the um, uh, April if you're watching it you know in May you could probably you know you can definitely take advantage of it because you probably was unclean during the first month anyway so you can get ready for it in the second month but this is the only feast day that's like that now the Passover falls on the 14th day looking over in the Jubilees chapter 49 uh, verse 1 and verse 10 it gives us more detail about when um, 
these feast days start and it just backs up Leviticus 23 but we see that Passover is on the 14th unleavened bread is on the 15th and the feast of first fruits is on the 16th now pointing to the Messiah and how that worked out with him remember it was Passover that they put him on the cross it was unleavened bread that he was actually in the in the tomb there and then when they went to look for him he had actually risen from the dead and that's why they that's what it means by the first fruits the Messiah it was the first fruits to rise from the dead and for those who want to celebrate the uh, resurrection day you know there's a lot of people who want to celebrate the resurrection of the Messiah well it was actually on the feast of first fruits that we were supposed to celebrate that day that's when we're supposed to have the first fruit celebration all right so that was the end of my slides I guess that's the end of what I had to say about Passover if you have any more questions on pa Passover or unleavened bread or first fruits or any of the holy days or anything in this presentation please feel free to list them down below if you got something out of the video go ahead and hit the like button if you didn't go ahead and hit the unlike button but leave a comment either way and shalom